with the advent of Hitler, the German Air Force came back to life. Glider clubs for Hitler youth were fostered throughout the fatherland. For the bigger boys, flying sports clubs were the attraction. First, Germany's aviation industry was ordered to build only commercial planes, easily convertible for military purposes. Then, ignoring the Versailles Treaty, Hitler gave Air Minister Goering the green light to go into mass production of fighters and bombers. America, the cradle of aviation, soon was outmanned and outplaned. We didn't seem to know that it took one year to train a pilot and five years to design and build a plane. Hermann Goering did. Hitler now had a powerful political weapon, and waxing Nazi aggressive ambition put it to use. Mechanized forces with 400 aircraft began to cross the Austrian border on March 11, 1938. Hitler himself followed the next day and formally swallowed up the Republic of Austria and its small air force, prelude to World War II. September 29, 1938, Hap Arnold became chief of the Army Air Corps. With Andrews, he briefed General Marshall on the air facts of life. On the day following Arnold's appointment, the Munich Agreement was signed. Without firing a shot or dropping a bomb, Hitler's military machine had won for him a great victory. But Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain thought he had achieved peace, peace in our time. The very next day, 500 German aircraft assisted in the invasion of the Sudetenland. By appeasement, Hitler had conquered Czechoslovakia. Six months later, the Czech Republic was dissolved. On the fateful dawn of September 1st, 1939, Hitler directed the German army and Luftwaffe in a lightning-like campaign. The map was Poland. The plan was surprise. Twenty years before, President Wilson had warned us that any future war will inevitably open with great aerial activity. Wilson was right. Without warning, 2,000 modern German combat planes took off for the first aerial blitz in the history of the world. Poland died on its air. With this earth-shattering overture played by strafing Stuka bombers, World War II began. Ironically, the method the Germans followed in this Polish campaign was the same one by which we, on a far larger scale, would defeat Germany. As thousands of bombs demolished Polish cities, the U.S. Air Corps learned a lesson. Now Hitler's threat, today Germany, tomorrow the world, was both believed and feared. When German forces, led by her Luftwaffe, began to overrun the map of Europe early in 1940, across Denmark and Norway, then southward, speeding over Holland and Belgium toward France, I, as a military observer, filed my reports. The air war that everyone feared had, in fact, started. While German troops and airmen goose-stepped on the heart of Paris, the Luftwaffe was invincible but the triumphs of 1939 and 40 had all been scored against weak opposition. After the French surrender, June 22nd, only the RAF remained for the Luftwaffe to conquer. A test of strength soon came, the battle for Britain. The Luftwaffe set to its task of controlling all Western Europe by crossing the channel. The RAF was ready, but outnumbered. Warned of the approaching attack, their fighter command sprang to the task of trying to hold off the invasion. The outnumbered few fought back with more than blood, sweat, and tears. They had spitfires and hurricanes in their aircraft arsenal and a modest but well-trained force of airmen. The best that Gehring had to offer was knocked out of the sky. Royal Air Force, outnumbered two to one, brought the Luftwaffe to a standstill and chased them back across the channel. Then Britain's warning centers reported that Gehring switched to night raids. Although slowed down by ground and air defenses, the Luftwaffe's final effort was desperate. 
The repeated night raids on southern ports and shipping were furious, but Britain was safe. 